It's good to be back. Good to be here with you again. Thank you for having me as your guest this Sunday. Pastor Thompson really didn't have to twist my arm too far uh, to come down and spend more time with you. I used to think that growing up that if you drove beyond Gibsonia, it was like when the earth was flat, you just fall off the, the face of the earth. But turns out there are people out there and even LCMS churches. Uh, so I come from St. Luke up in Cabot. There's four services in a weekend at St. Luke. So we had to get a little creative uh, this morning, but I was able to slip away and, and be here with you. The congregation is so, so supportive of helping our our fellow sister churches in the synod and the district. Uh, and so they send not only their greetings, but their love and their blessings as well this day. Knowing that you also follow the three-year lectionary for the signed readings for each Sunday, I hurried up and I excitedly looked up what the readings were going to be, and I said, oh, the parable of the ten virgins. Oh, man. <laughs> Just being honest. Just being honest, I never really liked that parable, if a pastor can, is allowed to say that. Now you're thinking, man, this is going to be a great sermon then. <laughs> I think for me, it's just, uh, it hits a little too close to home, maybe. I never feel like I'm the one who's on top of things, you know. I'm not the one with extra oil with me. I'm more of a procrastinator who's late in the game with decision-making and a step behind. I'd be the one whose wick was about to burn out, fumbling around in the dark, kind of missing out on the party. I was always the kid running around in the clothing racks in J.C. Penney while mom and uh, my brothers were heading to the car wondering, where the heck am I? <laughs> so this parable isn't necessarily my favorite. I mean, I get it. We're supposed to always be ready, that there should be focus on Jesus' second coming. I just struggle with the, the intangibleness, the abstractness of it. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean, uh, it means 100% that I believe that it is going to happen. There's not beyond a shadow of a doubt. Jesus is coming back. That is for certain. I'll bet my eternal life on that. But not knowing when or what, that can just be hard for me. Just to maintain this perpetual uh, lookout posture, kind of indefinitely, in perpetuity on and on and on, I tend to get discouraged or even a little bummed. Until, until we get to the epistle reading from 1 Thessalonians. Then I was excited again. Here, Paul isn't being so abstract. In fact, he actually gives us a good bit of detail about what's going to happen on that great day. Here again from verse, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Jesus is coming back, like he left. There'll be a trumpet blast. Bill, now I know why you like the trumpet so much. It's God's instrument, apparently. A big resurrection, a big reunion. A key phrase that I'm going to focus on in just a minute. And then it's as if the Holy Spirit and Paul are writing just to me this week in verse 18. And anyone else feeling just a bit discouraged by Matthew 25. It says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. What words? I need encouragement. We will always be with the Lord. Say that phrase with me, if you will. We will always be with the Lord. That's just what I needed to hear. Other pastors have taught me that you can pick up on different things in that verse depending on how you hear it, but the promise is there. And there is certainty in it. 
and I love certainty. One of the ways to hear it is this way. We will always be with the Lord. Say it that way with me now. We will always be with the Lord. So many times we think of Jesus as our friend and our brother, and he is. But I don't hear enough about Jesus' lordship. Here, Jesus is saying to you and to me, I know in my physical absence, there are times when things seem pressing, that it can feel like God's maybe not acting in certain ways, and that things seem to be going from bad to worse. But you are still living in his kingdom. He is still actively ruling and reigning from on high. And there will come a point from which that point forward, we will always be with the Lord. And it won't fall short like earthly rulers and others he places over us. It'll be he and he alone. In just a few minutes, we'll confess our faith together in the Apostles' Creed. And we'll use the meaning of the second article as well, the second paragraph of the creed, which reminds us when we say, what does this mean when we say this every week? It goes on to explain that it says it this way, in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And Luther goes on to help us understand that when we say that, We may not think it every time, but that we live under him in his care, that we are his, that we're living in his kingdom, that we're subject to him and we serve him, the lordship of Jesus. We don't always see it right now, but then we will see it with our own eyes, the crucified one, the risen one, the one who reigns over all at whose name every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That Jesus we know now by faith, but then we will see with our eyes. And all those intangible things that we struggle with will be crystal clear, blatantly obvious, clear as day. You and I won't miss it. Even for those of us who are hardest of hearing, there's no missing that trumpet blast. And that is very encouraging to me. And so Paul says, encourage other, each other with these words. We will always be with the Lord. But there's another way that you can hear it. We will always be with the Lord. Say it that way with me, if you will. We will always be with the Lord. God doesn't promise that just you'll be there or just I'll be there, but there's a corporate nature to this promise that all those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, the dead who will be raised, who are left, those of us who are still alive, All of us, we together will be with the Lord. Maybe you just talked about that last weekend in our focus on All Saints Day. It's not just you and Jesus or me and Jesus, but all of us together. Some of you who know me a little better may be thinking, well, I don't know if I want to spend always with you. I like you and all, but... And if, if it was true, if it was me right now, how you see me, uh, let me borrow from the angels for a minute, fear not. It's not the sinful me that you see before you that you want to spend always with. No, I wouldn't either. And there's some of you, the sinful you, I don't want to always be with you either. But on that day... On that day, our bodies will be raised in perfection. This will be the glorified me that you get to spend always with. And me with the glorified you. That doesn't sound so bad. In fact, that sounds really good that we'll be together. 
in his kingdom, under our Lord Jesus, in community with one another, the restored people of God, one with another. That's something to look forward to. And that too is very encouraging to me. You all are very encouraging to me. And so I look forward to that time together more than just once or twice a year when circumstances demand it, right? We will always be with the Lord. There's one more way, perhaps, that you can hear this blessed promise. If you're still in Matthew 25 worrying if your wick is going to run out, or if you have enough oil to last the night, if, if time is running out, here is a comforting word of promise to you. Always. We will always, always be with the Lord. Say it that way with, with me one more time if you would. We will always be with the Lord. We live in this time and place where Nothing is permanent. Things are transient. Things fall apart. Our cars fall apart. Our houses fall apart. Our relationships fall apart. In the second half of my life now, I'm ever more increasingly aware that our bodies fall apart. There's an impermanence to life this side of heaven. Life is so fragile. And permanence is lacking. That as my watch, as I watch my own wick quickly burning up, I see my oil running low. If I even remember to pay attention to it at all on that given day. And so I long, I just long for this sense of permanence in this world. As I meticulously rake up every last leaf in my yard and make that extra trip across the grass just to grab that one that fell while I was raking. So it's a clean lawn. I go back in to wash my hands in the sink. I hear a whirling whoosh outside, and I look out only to see half my neighbor's lawn now covering mine again. And I just long for permanence in this world. And on a more serious note, all of the many times that I've stood by the graveside of a loved one and had to say goodbye, or the injustice that's so prevalent in our world, I just truly long for something more substantial. I yearn for the day when good things will be more permanent. And so when it's promised that we will not just be with the Lord, that seeing Jesus face to face as if that wasn't enough by itself, that it's not just going to be me or not just going to be you, but it's we who are with the Lord, but not just for a moment, not a quick second, not one Sunday morning only in seven, that we will always be with the Lord. That is so very, very comforting to me. That which we behold now by faith, then we will see with our eyes, and it will be glorious. The Lord will be glorious. We will see it. He will reign forever and ever, and it will always be. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. In Jesus' name, amen.